Hey guys, what's up? Man, I really need a better background than this. Anyway, finally getting the video out. Um, before I get on with this one, I just wanted to state an apology for something that you guys have very, most of you probably have no idea about, but still feel like apologizing anyway. There is some stuff that I recently did a few weeks ago that I thought the footage would be up by now but because of um, a lot of people's busy schedules and the fact that they have a lot of work to do, it's not up yet. So, it's weird that I'm apologizing for something you guys have no idea is coming. There's some, going to be some special stuff coming up soon, but I don't want to talk about it now because I want it to be a surprise, but it's coming, so whatever. You know what? Forget it. Pretend that I didn't say anything at all. I, I, maybe. I, some special's coming soon. That's all I'm going to say. Be done with that. Anyway, on with the... <laughs> was just a weird forget it <laughs> let's just get on with it okay guys so today we're going to be talking about a weapon that i don't really use all that much i haven't really trained with but i'm still interested in and that's the chinese saber which is collectively known as doll in particular we're going to be talking about this specific weapon here which is commonly called a hondo basically um, signifying that it was the saber or the doll that was used during the Han Dynasty, you know, many thousands of years ago. Um, interestingly enough, though, that's not really what this weapon is called, or at least that's not what they called it back then. Um, the problem with calling something a Han Dao or a, you know, a Dynasty doll is it makes it sound like, okay, this is the one that they all used, and there were a couple of variations of this used even back then. Typically, if we wanted to be a little bit more specific with the name of this type of weapon, we'd be calling it a, and please forgive my pronunciation because I know I'm going to be butchering these, but um, it's the Zibedo or Zibedo. I think I got it written. Oh, of course, I'll have the terms popping up on the screen. But a Zibedo, otherwise known as a straight backed saber. Because, well, as you can tell by its, you know, being in the scabbard here, this isn't exactly curved. Well, it kind of is, but I'll get into that in a moment. But these are typically straight backs. They're not the typical saber that we tend to think about when we think of Chinese martial arts and Chinese swords. Um, they were pretty straight. Um, and in fact, this particular one, if we want to get to a more specific name, we'd be calling these Huan Shodal, or ringed sabers, because of this ring here. So let's take a closer look at this baby here, which was a reproduction, well, an early reproduction that was made by the same guys that made the LK5 that I reviewed just a little while ago. Um, this was an earlier version. They are planning on revising it a little bit, but this is still typically what you would expect, like from a piece back then. Though, of course, there are going to be some type of variations in terms of how it's made, the steel that was used, and the blade geometry itself. As you can see, this particular blade is straight. You can see that its edge doesn't go, it doesn't take up most of the blade's profile, unlike a lot of later swords where the edge pretty much continues to mostly toward the back of the spine before it terminates and then this, you get a, on a different bevel. The bevel is much closer to the edge, giving it a kind of chisel type of definition to it which I believe helps it to go through armor a little bit easier. In fact, all the way up until the Tang Dynasty, you tend to still see this particular um, blade geometry before they moved on to the type where the edge bevel is much further back along the blade. As you can see, the spine is quite thick. And this particular one doesn't have that much distal taper, making this feel quite substantive in the hand like it, I would almost this is almost going into crowbar territory in terms of how it feels thankfully it's not that bad there is still some distal taper on this but not much though I'm thinking that that might also be you know something that they're planning on improving but some earlier examples of this weapon might have been made like this as well in fact if we're going to be comparing this to the Dian that were used during that time period you know what we collectively call Han Dian those weapons were known to be much lighter than these and that's you know <laughs> i can definitely testify to that so they were made this way of you know from what i was told and from the research to make it much more effective with the cut and getting through armor in the beginning they really liked their den they really liked their straight swords 
But when they started dealing with cavalry coming in from the north, they realized that those weapons were a lot more effective in dealing heavier blows, and so they developed this weapon to um, deal with that type of combat and come up with a more effective way of, you know, you know, of dealing a more effective blow and getting through armor and so on and so forth. So it is a much more substantive weapon when swinging it, you know, especially because of the thicker spine and, you know, the way the weight is distributed along the blade. Another thing I find interesting about this particular piece is even though, like I said, you've got that bevel, which is closer to the edge, this is not exactly straight. There is a slight concave shape to the blade. I don't know how well you can see that, but it's kind of similar to that, you know, scalloped roof tile type of look that we have seen in some of the other um, Han Dynasty Gen that I showed you guys before. Um, I'm not exactly sure what that is for, but I'm assuming that's partially lightening the blade a little bit by having a little bit more concave and possibly to make it a little bit easier when going through the target. But again, I am not certain on that particular bit. I should have probably asked before doing the video, but kind of forgot to. The one thing I find really interesting is the fact that the blade is straight, which leads me to believe that it made it a little bit easier for the, you know, troops who were already used to using a gen to adapt to this weapon a bit more in terms of how it's being used. If you're already used to using a particular straight weapon and now you're gravitating to something like this, having it a somewhat similar shape would make it easier for you to, you know, transfer your techniques. Yeah, it's a little bit heavier and it's a little bit geared more toward the, you know, the cut. But the fact that it's straight means you can still do effective thrusts with it. And as we know, the Gen is a cut and thrust sword. So transferring those techniques to this shouldn't have been all that difficult. And I suspect, especially with the use of the shield, which these weapons were paired with, there probably wasn't too much of a difference. And in fact, this is where we start getting to certain misconceptions about Dao in particular. There is a general belief when it comes to Dian and Dao that Dian were only given to the elites and higher ranked nobles and the Dao was basically given to the standard foot soldier and people believe that, that um, it was proven true considering that this weapon surplanted the Dian on the battlefield um, for most of Chinese um, war history. There were brief periods where the Jin came back on the battlefield, depending on which dynasty we're looking at, but for the most part, the Dao reigned supreme. There is a little bit of a misconception there in saying that these weapons were not used by nobles back during the Han Dynasty, because they were. Um, in fact, even when this weapon, you know, first came about and it was quickly gobbled up, you know, by people, you still had those who were, who were using the Jin as much as the Dao. What and um, in nobles and you know foot soldiers alike just had their preference as to whether they were going to be using the Zen or the Dao. What really separated the weapons between one that was used by a nobleman and one that was used, you know, by the higher ranking elites or higher up officers, and one that was used by foot soldiers, were the accoutrements that were put onto the blade. So if you were somebody who was using, say, a weapon like this, where it's obviously just you know it's steel you know, with a simple ring on the end of it and nothing, nothing fancy about the scabbard and all that, yeah, this is pretty much what a foot soldier would be using. Whereas a more noble guy, you know, his scabbard would be a little bit more decorated. It would have jade instead of bronze on it. You know, there, there would probably be inscriptions on the blade. You know, the ring might be a bit decorated or something. They might be using better material for that to handle. That's basically what separated it. If you want a, a bit of quick rule of thumb, if you happen to see a Hun Dynasty Dian and it has jade fittings on it, that's probably, what, and the same thing with these. If it's got jade fittings on it, it probably went to the nobles. If it was just brass or bronze or something like that, or, you know, very, very cheap fittings, yeah, that's what went to the more common foot soldier or common army. So now that kind of leads us to this ring. As you know, with the, um, what you would call it, with the Han Dian, I keep pointing that way, you can't see it, but that's why I've got them sitting right now. In fact, give me a second. So if we look at this one here, and you look at the pommel, you can see you've got that nice flat piece, which is fairly typical of what you would expect to see of a den during that time period. By the way, I don't know if I ever discussed it, but the reason why this thing is like that is to kind of assist with a thrust. Like if you're, you know, you're trying to stab, <laughs> get the back out the way. If you're trying to make a thrust, say, and you're trying to get that extra oomph in the armor, Besides just simply using two hands to try to thrust through, you could also just 
you know, just kind of hammer that in. And having this flat makes it a lot easier to do that. Whereas if the pommel is more triangle shaped and you try to do that, yeah, that, that, that might hurt the palm a little bit. This makes it a lot easier. Um, I don't know if I ever pointed that out, but that was something that I always found kind of funny and fascinating. But there you go. Anyway. Yeah, this particular piece has that particular pommel. The Han um, doll, or should I say these Zibe doll, these earlier um, Wansho doll, have the rings. Now, I've <laughs> the ring thing kind of amuses me because I remember way back years ago on my channel when I was talking about rings at the end of Dao, at the time I really didn't have any idea why these were there. And I assumed that the reason why these were there, one of the assumptions I had was to help tie it down to something. Like you can take the, you can either use the ring to hang on the wall or hang off of a hook somewhere or to hang off of your belt by tying, you know, a string or something to it and tying to that. I remember one person being really adamant that I was dead wrong and came up with a really ridiculous explanation as to why the ring was there. I don't really want to get into it. But it turns out I was right. I didn't know at the time, but that was my guess, and it turns out I was right. Yeah. See, these were modeled after earlier dao that were, you know, made out of bronze back then, and those had rings. And those rings were on there specifically to hang off of belts or on hooks or on walls or something like that, so easy access. And when they started making bigger versions of these for use of warfare, the rings ended up being, of course, you know, if let's say you're on horseback or something and you got the string there and it's tied to your belt or it's tied to the saddle, it makes it a lot harder to lose it just in case something happens. Um, now, granted, now they're using them with scabbards, so the hanging off the hook thing is not as important anymore. That was for more of the smaller, you know, more utility knives. However... Because they were using their, they, the rings were at the end of the smaller ones, it just kind of became custom to put them at the ends of the bigger ones. So it became less of a practical reason, though the, the practical use was still there, just not as important as before. But it became more of a decorative reason. And you definitely see that by the time you reach the Tang Dynasty, where they still have the rings, but now the rings are decorated. You see all these little inscriptions in the middle, or it's mostly filled, but that ring is still there. So it just simply became custom to let's just put the ring at the end of the doll. And, you know, having a bunch of stuff in the middle of it makes it a little bit harder to, like, have it hanging off of that, or, you know, you know, putting string in there to, you know, tie down to something. But that's pretty much what it's there. And again, as usual with pommels, it helps to counterbalance the weight. If you got a nice thick piece here to counteract, you know, the weight here, it makes it a bit easier to use. And that's something that you happen to see in cultures all around the world as far as swords are concerned. So the reason why I'm bringing this particular weapon up is because I recently had found out and I thought it was kind of fascinating how it shattered a misconception. And I also believe that, you know, the nobility preferred the Dian and not the Dao. And yet recent evidence that I encountered, I mean, the evidence itself is not recent, it was recent for me is that nobles like this weapon too. I, they've, you know, I've seen examples of these being excavated from, you know, the graves of more higher up citizens and, you know, nobility and elites, so uh, officers, so on and so forth. And you also see pictures, like you see, you know, drawings of, you know, higher ranking Chinese um, warriors proudly displaying their doll, practicing with it, posing with it, whatever. You know, it's like that this became their favorite weapon to use, which I can understand why. If you have a weapon that gives a more authoritative cut because of its weight and its blade geometry, and yet you can still use the techniques that, you, more or less, use the techniques that you were originally using with the lighter weapon, yeah, I can understand why it would become a favorite, especially in conjunction with a good shield. Just like the Dian used back then, they did have one-handed and two-handed versions. And just like the weapons back then, the Dao ended up being particularly long. It's kind of funny to me how modern reproductions of weapons used back during, you know, the Han Dynasty, they always make the weapons kind of short. I'm seeing a lot of errors, especially with Han Dao, you tend to see, you know, I should say Wan Shou Dao. Um, they tend to make the blades like around 22 inches in length, 24 inches in length. When in reality, back then, they were as long as the Dian. And as we know, the Dian used back during the Han Dynasty were quite long. Even the one-handers. 
So just like with the dead, you would see one-handed versions of these with blades as long as, say, I don't know, like 86 centimeters in length just for a one-handed sword. And the two-handers were even bigger. Like, you saw how long the Striking Eagle and Roaring Dragon swords that I recently reviewed, you saw how long those were. There were a Han Dynasty doll pretty much reaching those same lengths. So, and considering the thicker back and the somewhat heavier weights, you can imagine how strong those guys must have been in order to use those weapons. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's weird how we just keep getting these, you know, weapons, these modern day reproductions that don't really match what was used back in the past. But it shouldn't really be all that surprising. I mean, I can go into the woes that the Chinese sword industry has been dealing with in terms of authenticity and, you know, the things they deal with. But to be honest, it's not like we haven't seen similar things happening with European markets as well. Keep in mind that for a long time, and even to this day, there are people who still think that the long sword used by um, medieval fighters were these huge, heavy, cumbersome weapons that couldn't cut and that were used with no skill or finesse whatsoever. And those of us who you know something about martial arts knows that's far from the truth, but that's the misconception. And unfortunately, there are sword markets that make weapons like that much more back in the past, but thankfully less so these days. But they were making those according to those misconceptions because they didn't know any better. Same thing is going on with the Chinese market, but the Chinese sword market is improving. So just got to give them a little bit more time to start making some decent weapons like these. So yeah, I thought I would just touch on this weapon a little bit. I swung this thing around a little bit. The reason why I have not reviewed this, and I've had this for quite some time, is simply because this is basically an early production of a weapon that the forgers want to uh, improve. I don't know when they're going to be making another version of this, but I just, at least for historical reasons, and just, just to give a basic overview of this particular piece. I don't want to review this particular piece, because like I said, it's an earlier version, it's not perfect, and they said they were going to be making a better version, that will probably go out to the market, but just, you know, I just thought it would be kind of cool to bring about. I have whipped this weapon around a little bit. It functions quite well. It's not sharp, like, as you can see, I could just run this around, you know, on my arm. No cuts. Um, but I use this against a dead tree. I should have recorded the footage. Because of the weight and how well forged this thing is, it still did quite a bit of damage to the poor, you know, piece of dead wood. But, yeah, it's... It, yeah, this is a, a, a nice hunk of metal. If I decide to have this thing sharpened, I'm pretty sure it's going to be quite impressive in tests. But for now, it's just a nice little piece to have, you know, just to, like, talk about and, you know, research, you know. It's a, you know, it's a good conversation piece, I should say. And it also makes for a good training piece as well, considering the weight. If you really want to, like, build up your forearms, try tossing this thing around a little bit. So I thought you guys would find that a little bit interesting. Um... Next time I bring up martial arts stuff, I'll probably come up with something a little bit more detailed and a little bit more interesting. Next video I do, though, is definitely not going to be about martial arts because I got stuff I need to touch on. So, but anyway, I hope you like this one and hope you found it interesting. And I'll catch you guys later. By the way, um, something that I I usually don't do, and I still feel uncomfortable doing this, though I was recently um, advised by um, somebody close to me that I really should be doing this more often. I, I don't know. But, uh, what the hell. I'm putting this at the end of the freaking video so that the rest of you guys don't have to deal with this if you don't want to. I have a Patreon. You guys probably know, or you guys probably don't, but I do have a Patreon up for people who are inclined to support the channel. And it's, I mean, I... I hesitate to talk about it because one, I need to re, um, I gotta redo the, you know, the, the tiers that I have for it because I'm not happy with the way it is and the rewards that are given. Um, I tried setting up a meeting with the people in Patreon on how we want to set it up, wasn't able to get it going, but some of them seemed happy with the newer ideas that I wanted. Um, but yeah, that's one reason why I was a little bit hesitant, like talking about it. Another reason is simply because. I don't put out videos nearly as often as other people. And so I'm kind of hesitant on saying, hey, you know, I put up a couple of videos, you mind supporting channel? It feels a little weird to me. 
not to mention that I do do this as a hobby. YouTube is not my career. It's not the main way I make money. However, it is something that does take a little bit of effort to do. And recently, one of my excursions that I did specifically for, well, really, I did it more for personal reasons, but it definitely is going to lead to YouTube things. That also took quite a bit of change in my pocket. Um, not that you guys owe me that money. You don't. But for anybody who, you know, likes what I do here, who wants to kind of help me to keep things running, you know, it would be, it's a, you know, if you feel like doing it, I definitely would appreciate it. So I'm just saying this just to remind you guys of it. But of course, it's not going to stop me from making videos because, again, this is a hobby of mine. And when something's a hobby, that means you do it because you like it. And ultimately, I do like doing this. So I'm going to keep on doing it for as long as I have the interest. But for those who would like to, you know, give, you know, my efforts a little bit of, you know, just a little bit of support, not to mention that the support that that channel gets would help me to do other special projects that I want to do for the channel. Yeah, just if you feel like doing it, definitely, you know, I definitely am not going to say no. So that's that. Man, that's uncomfortable.